an allegation that is raised in almost every revisionist literature that I can find on this topic is that the Bolsheviks were mostly comprised of Jewish intellectuals and that therefore a foreign element was responsible in the subversion and hostile takeover of Russian society, which was overwhelmingly white and orthodox Christian, leading to countless millions of dead. But how Jewish were the Bolsheviks really? Now there's two main ways how our side responds to the claims of Jewish Bolshevism. The first method, and I've seen all of this very often, that's why I just say two, um, the first method is by pointing out that the Bolsheviks were atheists. And so the whole concept of them being Jews or Jewish is quite meaningless because they didn't care about Jehovah God. They didn't have the Torah in their home. They didn't pray with the prayer shawls and stuff like that. They didn't give a crap about the whole religion called Judaism. So still calling them Jewish is then not really productive. That's the first approach. But that approach is wrong because... Judaism is more than just a religion, it's also an ethnic community, it's a people. We talk about the Jewish people. Of course, race would be a very crude term to describe it, but that's why I avoid using that. But there are many atheist Jews even today, and they will be very upset if you say that they're not Jews anymore. The second approach is by taking the Nazi route. And that means saying, Oh, you want to talk about Jewish Bolshevism? You know who else talked about Jewish Bolshevism? The freaking Nazis! I mean, that was like one of the pillars of Nazism, the belief in Jewish Bolshevism. Alfred Rosenberg was one of the chief Nazi ideologues who wrote a lot about this. And have you ever heard of a guy called freaking Joseph Goebbels, Minister of Propaganda? Do you know how much he talked about Jewish Bolsheviks? Are you seriously trying to peddle the Nazi rhetoric here by coming here with Jewish Bolsheviks? Because then I have no time for you. So this is the second approach, by basically reducing everything to, oh, the evil Nazis talked about it, so it's obviously bullshit. That also doesn't work in an actual scholarly debate. If we are going to examine the notion of Jewish Bolshevism, we have to strip away all the emotions and just look at the facts. Are the revisionists right? when they say that the Bolsheviks were mostly Jewish. So in this video, I'm not going to take the usual route of defamation and calling it Nazi stuff or saying that Judaism is a religion and all that. I'm just going to look at how many of the Bolsheviks were Jews. We can start at the very beginning, that is to say, before the Bolshevik party was even established, because that's where the revisionist allegations begin. And one allegation is that there was a very rich American banker called Jacob Schiff. And he sent tons of money to finance the Bolsheviks. And that Jacob Schiff was a Jewish banker. And so there's the Jewish roots of the Bolshevik party. This is a lie. While it is true that Jacob Schiff was a rich Jewish banker, and while it is true that he hated the Tsar, and while it is true that he sent money to Japan to finance the Imperial Japanese Army while they were fighting a war against the Russians, there is no proof at all that he sent money to finance the Bolsheviks. Now, some may think that the whole idea of Wall Street capitalists financing the Bolsheviks is a conspiracy theory, but that's just not the case. It really is true. And a good book that I can recommend on this subject matter is Professor Anthony Sutton's Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, the remarkable true story of the American capitalists who financed the Russian communists. And Anthony C. Sutton is not just some dude. I mean, he was a British and American economist, historian, and writer. And he was an economics professor at California State University, LA. So, and here's an excerpt that the Twitter account of Holocaust Controversies, which is Confronting Denial, posted. Let me read from it. It is significant that documents in the State Department files confirm that the investment banker Jacob Schiff, often cited as a source of funds for the Bolshevik Revolution, was in fact against support of the Bolshevik regime. 
This position, as we shall see, was in direct contrast to the Morgan Rockefeller promotion of the Bolsheviks. The persistence with which the Jewish conspiracy myth has been pushed suggests that it may well be a deliberate device to divert attention from the real issues and the real causes. The evidence provided in this book suggests that the New York bankers, who were also Jewish, had relatively minor roles in supporting the Bolsheviks, while the New York bankers, who were Gentiles, that is to say Morgan, Rockefeller, and Thompson, had major roles. So there's that. Now, before you demonize the Rockefellers or anybody else who financed the Bolsheviks, you have to keep in mind that we all have 2020 hindsight. But back then, nobody really knew what would happen when the Bolsheviks came to power. I mean, the idea that we now sort of make them responsible for all the untold suffering that the Bolsheviks did and all the millions of people that they ended up killing is a bit weird. That's not how I would do it. Because back then, the real evil was the Tsarist regime and all the amount of people that it was suppressing. So... The New York capitalists thought that they were doing something good here, and yeah, that went wrong. Of course. So when a revisionist comes and tells you that the Bolsheviks were mostly Jews, the first question you should ask him is, how exactly can you tell? Because the Bolsheviks, or the Bolshevik party, existed for many, many years. So if you want to prove that the majority of Bolsheviks were Jews, you have to say exactly when. Was it the entire time, or was it just during a certain year? Was it in the beginning? Was it towards the middle, or the end? Here's the thing. Anybody who has done a little bit of research will know that the longer the Soviet Union existed, the more it became dominated by one man, and that is Joseph Stalin. And Joseph Stalin was not a Jew, he was a Georgian. What's also interesting is that the Soviet Union, after the establishment of Israel, was not a friend of Israel. In fact, the Soviets never really liked Zionism in the first place, which is about finding a home for the Jewish people. The Soviet Union, in fact, ended up supporting the Arab states against Israel. These are certain things that you need to know before we get into this debate. And this diametric opposition between the ideologies of communism and Zionism was observed not just sometime in the 1960s, but as early as 1920 when Winston Churchill published an essay which was even titled Zionism versus Bolshevism, which revisionists mistakenly cite as proof of the right honorable Winston Churchill himself talking about a worldwide Jewish conspiracy. Instead, in this essay, Churchill is basically saying that the Jews of the world are divided into three groups. Those loyal to their nations, those wanting to establish a home in Israel, and those who have become Bolsheviks. Basically, in the entire article, Winston Churchill thinks that there are good Jews and there are bad Jews. And you know what? He is absolutely right. There are good Christians and there are bad Christians. There's good atheists and bad atheists. Good Muslims, bad Muslims, you know. For example, Winston Churchill writes under National Jews, There are all sorts of men, good, bad, and for the most part indifferent in every country and in every race. Nothing is more wrong than to deny to an individual, on account of race or origin, his right to be judged on his personal merits and conduct. He continues to say, at the present fateful period, there are three main lines of political conception among the Jews, two of which are helpful and hopeful in a very high degree to humanity, and the third absolutely destructive. First, there are the Jews who, dwelling in every country throughout the world, identify themselves with that country, enter into its national life, and while adhering faithfully to their own religion, regard themselves as citizens in the fullest sense of the state which has received them. Such a Jew living in England would say, I am an Englishman practicing the Jewish faith. This is a worthy conception and useful in the highest degree. Winston Churchill then also says that in our own army, Jewish soldiers have played a most distinguished part, some rising to the command of armies, others winning the Victoria Cross of Valor. In this essay, written in 1920, 
while Churchill, as an external observer, does make the mistake of thinking Bolshevism was chiefly Jewish, he nevertheless makes several good observations such as explaining why Jews there felt drawn to the Bolshevik Revolution. In the very beginning of the essay, Winston Churchill points out the miserable state of Russia, where of all countries in the world, the Jews were the most cruelly treated. And Winston Churchill also explains the adherents of this sinister confederacy are mostly men reared up among the unhappy populations of countries where Jews are persecuted on account of their race. So you can see here how Winston Churchill admits why some Jews decided to join the Bolshevik party. And also pointing out Trotsky's hatred of Zionism. This is why Churchill called this essay a struggle for the soul of the Jewish people. You can't call it a struggle if all Jews are thinking the same way now, can you? Now, some of the more clever revisionists will tell you that obviously what matters is the beginning of the Bolshevik party. And they claim that the majority of the early Bolsheviks were Jews. This is one of their claims. Another claim of theirs, of course, is that even a little bit later in the 1920s, the majority of the Bolshevik party were Jews. So we have to look at exactly what year they're referring to when they come with their claims. If they cannot specify, then their claim can easily be discarded. And that brings me to the first issue I have with the revisionists, because they never really specify what they mean. The Bolsheviks were a huge party consisting of tens of thousands of members. They started quite small, but then they grew significantly. And the Bolshevik party was subdivided into different councils, I guess you can say. There was the general party membership, then there was the central committee, then there was the Politburo, then there were the people's commissars, and then there was the secret police, which was first called the Cheka and then the NKVD. And each of these groups had members, and so we can examine what exactly the amount of Jews was in each of these uh, groups. But if you want to talk about Bolsheviks in general and say that the majority of Bolsheviks were Jews, then it's going to be very easy for me to refute that. Let me explain. This image contains the amount of actual Jews, that is to say, people whose Jewish ancestry can be verified. Compare that to the various revisionist claims in their infographics that up to 95% of all Bolsheviks were Jewish. Oh boy. 42 members, 7 Jews, that's 16.6%. But we can go even further back to the Central Committee of the Communist Party in 1917. Out of the 26 members back then, only 6 were Jews, which is a 23% Jewish presence. That is a high presence, but still, it's nowhere what the revisionists are saying of 75, 80, 90%, or even more than half. Again, you can verify this yourself by simply googling up every single person's name and checking out their biography to see if they're Jewish or not. Simple as that. So from where do we get all these various lists about Bolsheviks being predominantly made out of Jews? I mean, how do these lists even appear? What are they made up of? There are three different ways revisionists create these lists. The first approach is creating an incomplete list where they have cherry-picked Jewish Bolsheviks, providing first name and last name, photo, date of birth, place of birth, short biography, etc., and sprinkled in a handful of non-Jews to make the list look more authentic, and then state, here's the list, as you can see, more than 80% Jews. Except that list is nowhere near complete, that is to say, we don't know how many party members there were in total, and therefore only a selective snippet into which the revisionist has put in as many Jews as possible and thus created a percentage of his own choosing. That is the first approach. The second approach is creating a list of communist Jews Again, providing first name and last name, photo, date of birth, place of birth, short bio, etc. And claiming, wow, look at this long and exhaustive list of communist Jews. This is one such example. However, 
as the name suggests, this list is no longer limited to Bolsheviks in Russia, but has seemingly scraped together any and all communist Jews across the world and across many decades. For example, even Chile's Salvador Allende from the 1970s is included in this list. Until you realize Salvador Allende was not a Jew in the first place. That means this list is full of bullshit. But even if, for argument's sake, we assume every person on this list was really Jewish, even then, this list does not give you the complete picture. Because, first of all, it has gone off topic from what percentage of Bolsheviks were Jews to what percent of Jews were communists. And by doing so, it has become incomplete again because the number of Jews worldwide who were communists pales in comparison to the number of Jews worldwide who are capitalists, like you and I. By the way, the existence of communist Jews and capitalist Jews is another nail in the coffin of all those who like to see Jews as some kind of hive mentality united in their fight against the Gentiles. The third approach is by producing a much longer list of only Bolsheviks that also overwhelmingly contains Jews. But what they do here is copy-paste a long list of only family names without first names, making independent verification all the tougher, and stamp the word Jew next to almost every one of them while providing no sources to back up their conclusion. But I will address the authenticity of this list later. As to my original image, you can look up each of the listed figures' bio in any encyclopedia and confirm what I have posted, that only a minority were Jews. Some revisionists who like to think themselves particularly clever point out to the picture of Lenin not having a Jewish star and begin to accuse me of having gotten the simplest of facts wrong. Many revisionists call Lenin a Jew, even though the only Jew in his entire bloodline was his great-grandfather on the maternal side, who remained a Jew for the majority of his life before converting to Orthodox Christianity as an old man after his religious Jewish wife had died, and his son, who was Lenin's grandfather, while being Jewish, was baptized at a very early age and he married a non-Jew, and they had a daughter, who was Lenin's mother, and she was a non-Jew because Jewishness is passed down by the mother, and therefore the Jewish line ended there, and so Lenin's mother was not a Jewess, and therefore Lenin was also not a Jew, because his father, by the way, was also not a Jew. So, the point is, Lenin was not a Jew. And I've done a more in-depth video about Lenin's family tree, which you will find in the video description. But let's move on. Other revisionists try to pin the whole thing on Putin as a credible authority, saying, Well, the president of Russia, who certainly ought to know things better about his own country than some random schmuck on the internet I'm trying to explain this to, said in a 2013 speech, and I quote, The decision to nationalize this library was made by the first Soviet government, whose composition was 80 to 85 percent Jewish. Sure, Putin may be the president of Russia, but that does not automatically mean he is right in everything he says. That would be an appeal to authority logical fallacy. Apparently they don't teach history in the KGB, because if we fact-check Putin's claim, we'll find out that he was bullshitting. Going through the 16 names on the first Council of People's Commissars under the Bolsheviks, there's precisely one Jew among them, Leon Trotsky except for the Ukrainian Lunacharsky and the Pole Theodorovich, everyone else was Russian. Therefore, the proportion of Jewish members, even back in 1917, was not 85% or even 80%, but 6.25%. Now that we come to think of it, there were many Jews in leadership roles in the party of the Mensheviks and the Socialist Revolutionaries, but very few among the Bolsheviks. 
The numbers are something like under 10% Jews in the top and middle tiers of Bolshevik leadership, around 25% or 30% among the socialist revolutionaries, and close to 40% among the Mensheviks. The only thing that all three had in common was that they weren't the Tsars, but they fought each other, and the more Jewish Mensheviks ended up losing. So much for the revisionist theory about Jews as a singular political force united against the Goyim, trying to take over a nation together. Oh boy. It's also funny how the handful of powerful Jewish Bolsheviks, like Leon Trotsky, who was commander of the Red Army for a while, or Genrik Jagoda, director of the NKVD for a while, actually got expelled and executed by their fellow communists. But regarding the so-called Jewish Bolshevism, I got even more facts coming your way. On the eve of the February Revolution in 1917, of about 23,000 members of the Bolshevik party, only 364, or about 1.6%, were ethnic Jews. According to the 1922 Bolshevik Party census, there were 19,564 Jewish Bolsheviks. However, while this may sound like an incredibly large number, this only comprised 5.21% of the total number of Bolsheviks in 1922, and in the 1920s, of the 417 members of the Central Executive Committee, the Party Central Committee, the Presidium of the Executive of the Soviets of the USSR, and the Russian Republic, the People's Commissars, 6% were ethnic Jews. So as you can see, of all these examples that I have provided with source, at different periods of time, the percentage of Jewish Bolsheviks among Bolsheviks was less than 10. Which of course is an overrepresentation. That is true, but I'm going to get to that later. Let's first address something else that I um, missed out on earlier, which is the long list of Jews of the Bolshevik party that is circulating on the internet. Is this list authentic? So this is the heart of the issue. On the internet, whether it is among clearly far-right forums such as Stormfront and the political boards of 4chan and 8chan, or even among more neutral and family-friendly places such as YouTube and its comments section, Twitter and Reddit, in discussions involving the Russian Revolution, there is always this certain long list of allegedly Jewish Bolsheviks in circulation. This list wasn't made up by some right-wing troll in the recent past, but has actually been in circulation since 1921 created by a man called Robert Wilton. Robert Wilton was based in Moscow as a journalist for the Times of London throughout the period of the Bolshevik Revolution. In 1919, he claimed that the Soviet press provided a list of 556 of the top figures of the Soviet government, identifying their ethnicity, and Wilton included it as an appendix in his book the Last Days of the Romanovs, which was published in 1920. The list included 17 Russians, 2 Ukrainians, 11 Armenians, 35 Latvians, or Lets, 15 Germans, 1 Hungarian, 10 Georgians, 3 Poles, 3 Finns, 1 Jek, 1 Karaim, which is a Jewish sect, and 457 Jews. And this list is also featured in revisionist Benton L. Bradbury, a somewhat wildly disseminated novel called The Myth of German Villainy, where, by the way, on page 65, Mr. Bradbury also repeats the long-debunked claim, the truly stupid claim, that Ashkenazi Jews are the descendants of Black Sea Khazars. And I'm going to debunk the whole Khazar hypothesis in a different video, because if I also put that into this one, then this video is going to get extremely long. But returning to the list, the list is also repeated on page 82 to 86 in Bradbury's book. The list is presented as proof that Jews dominated the early government of the Soviet Union. 
But is the list genuine? Here's something to begin with. Robert Wilton was an anti-Semite. More importantly, the list is made up. For example, take one of the more exotic-sounding names like Schillenkus. Type it into Google to try and find out more about this person. What do you get? Only the same copy-pasted list on various far-right sites. For me, another red flag is when going through that list, in most instances only the family name is given, making it hard for a non-scholar to fact-check whether that person really existed, who he or she was, and to verify their Jewish origin. And the list is also full of mistakes. For example, Spitzberg, Kaufmann, and Lelina were never commissars and were in all likelihood made-up people who never existed. There were no hygiene and refugee commissariats either. Robert Wilton made them up as well. Furthermore, the list is full of inaccuracies. For specific examples, Karl Lander was a Latvian and not Jewish. Jan Anwelt was an Estonian. He was not the head of the non-existent hygiene commission, but rather the commissar of a military academy. Alexander Schlichter and Vasily Schmidt were not Jewish, but of ethnic German descent. Long story short, this wildly disseminated list is a hoax that's been cooked up by a diplomat from 1921 called Robert Wilton. Wilton gives no verifiable source in his book because he made it all up. And now let's talk about the Politburo, which was the highest policy-making government authority under the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Basically an inner circle. It was founded in October 1917 and ended in 1991 with the breakup of the Soviet Union. Now here's where things get interesting. The Politburo makeup is perhaps the only place where revisionists can prove Jewish dominance. And their theory basically goes something like this. Since the Politburo was basically the inner circle, and since during a certain period of time Jews dominated the Politburo, they obviously also dominated all policymaking of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and therefore they dominated the entire Soviet Union, and therefore all of Bolshevism, etc., etc. And to prove this point, they take us back to the founding years of the Politburo, which was on August 18th, 1917, where it was Vladimir Lenin, a non-Jew, who set up this political bureau, after October 23rd, 1917, in the hopes of directing the October Revolution, and in the very beginning, it only had seven members. These original seven members of the Politburo were Lenin, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Stalin, Sokolnikov, and Bubnov. Out of these seven members, Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Sokolnikov were Jews. Kamenev was only half Jewish because he had a Jewish father, but a Gentile mother, and as per the laws of Jewish matrilineality, he was actually not Jewish. Similarly, as explained earlier, Lenin was just a quarter Jewish because he had a Jewish grandfather who had been baptized a Christian very early in his life, with a non-Jewish wife, and they had a non-Jewish daughter, and she married a non-Jewish man, and they had Lenin, so Lenin was officially not a Jew, and therefore three of the seven members means that even the original Politburo was not even majority Jewish. But here's the thing, even though the original Politburo was established formally consisting of these seven men, they never actually got to meet and talk because they were completely preoccupied with other things. And Trotsky himself has written about this in his memoirs. It was only later, when the Politburo kept growing in number, that it actually began to function as an organization. And by that time, which was around 1924, after Lenin's death, 
the Jewish domination had completely vanished. Oh, and here's another little tidbit of information. Stalin killed pretty much every single member of this Politburo during the Great Purge. So there's that. And the new people that came into the Politburo had absolutely no Jewish ancestry whatsoever. Ethnic Slavs dominated the Politburo until 1991. 89 members of the Politburo were Russians, which makes up 68%. In distant second were Ukrainians, who had 11 members in the Politburo, making up 8%. In third place are both ethnic Jews and Georgians, who had four members respectively. And this leads us to the final issue, which the revisionists still like to hold on to as a lifeline, which is, they say that Jewish people were overrepresented among the Bolsheviks, and that's a fact, because the Jews only made up about 2.5% of Russia, but they were more than 2.5% of Bolshevik uh, party members at various times, so that itself is a fact that they were overrepresented. Even if it, they were like 3 or 4%, that's still an overrepresentation. So we won. Uh, well, here's the thing. Okay, but in the entirety of the USSR's Communist Party in 1922, it is a historic fact that Baltic peoples were actually more overrepresented than Jews. But you'll never hear a revisionist scholar make an issue out of that, will you? No, of course not. They will never tell you that Baltic peoples were far more overrepresented than Jews. This was the composition of the entire CPSU in 1922. 72% Russian, which is about 53% of the USSR's population. 6% Ukrainian, which is about 21% of the USSR's population back then, so you can see that the Ukrainians were underrepresented. 5.2% Jewish, who made up 1.8% of the USSR's population. Not 2.5, sorry, just 1.8. So they are overrepresented, definitely. But then, here's where it gets interesting. 4.6% Baltic and Polish, although they only made up 0.6% of the USSR's population. Massive overrepresentation. 34 Transcaucasian, that means people from the other side of the Caucasus, who only made up 2.5% of the USSR's population. Again, they were also overrepresented. 2.5% Central Asian, who made up 7% of the USSR's population, so they were underrepresented. And so on. So, that's the truth. Furthermore, in the Civil War, 22,000 ex Tsarist officers served with the Red Army in 1918, and a total 48,000 in the entire Civil War. This element was crucial in preserving the Bolshevik Revolution. Needless to say, there was not a Jewish element amongst ex-Tsarist officers, because the Tsarist regime was quite anti-Semitic. Which was also, by the way, one of the reasons why Jews flocked to the Bolshevik movement. Neither was there a Jewish element amongst the primary commanders of the Red Army, the Latvian rifleman leader Joachim Vatsetis became commander-in-chief of the entire Red Army from September 1918 to July 1919. He was replaced by Sergei Kamenev, who was a Russian. Other important leaders of the Red Army were Vladimir Antonov Ovsienko, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, Mikhail Frunze, who was a Romanian, Clement Voroshilov, Vasily Bliukar, and Semyon Budyoni, who was a Cossack. Thus, it has been proven that there was a limited Jewish presence amongst the Bolsheviks, whether in the state, in the party, or in the military. Which leaves us with one other organization. Can you take a guess which one it is? I bet you know which one it is. The NKVD. NKVD stands for Narodnie Komisariat Vnutrenich Del. In English, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs was the Interior Ministry of the Soviet Union. In a crude way, the Gestapo of the Soviet Union. 
the Secret Service. Was the NKVD overwhelmingly Jewish? And the answer is yes. According to an article published on the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, the FAZ, and this is a reputable news source, there has been a study performed which concludes that up to 40% of the NKVD at one time was Jewish. Now, before all the revisionists start jumping up and down in joy saying, Ha! I knew it! Those Jewish monsters were massacring people. They are the executioners of the Soviet Union. They were Jewish all along. I knew it. Before that, just curb your enthusiasm, all right? Because here's the crucial info that you are missing. And that crucial part of the information is called Stalin's Great Purges. You can look this up yourself, it'll be too long for me to include in this video, but basically, Stalin hunted Jews throughout the 1930s. And while he started doing so in the 1920s in the party itself, the NKVD was left pretty much untouched until the 1930s. And by the end of the 1930s, the NKVD had been cleansed of all Jews. Remember Genrik Jagoda? That guy was dead. And this is where things get crucial, because all these so-called Jews from the NKVD were dead before the Katyn Forest Massacre happened in 1940. And I say this because I've seen so many revisionists say, oh, the Jews did Katyn, it wasn't the Russians who did Katyn, the Jews massacred all the Polish intelligentsia, the Jewish NKVD this, Jewish NKVD that. But this is the point that they're missing. There were no more Jews in the NKVD by the time all these atrocities happened. And this leads me to another interesting fact you may not have known. And that is that the world's worst mass murderer was not Hitler, was not Stalin, was not Mao, because those guys were just giving the orders, or involved in a huge war, but the guy who literally killed the most people single-handedly, himself. And if you think it was that Finnish sniper who killed a few hundred people, no, you're wrong. That guy was an absolute boy scout compared to this person. This monster was called Vasily Mikhailovich Blokhin. He was a Soviet Russian major general who served as the chief executioner of the NKVD under the administration of Stalin, and he basically killed about 7,000 Polish prisoners of war during the Katyn massacre in spring of 1940. 7,000 of up to, I think, 21,000 something was personally done by him. Now, if you believe that or not is up to you, but here are the sources. And over his entire career, over his entire ungodly military career, this guy killed almost 50,000 people himself. And this is probably the ultimate red pill that I can give to anybody, because it's full of facts and not full of lies and distortions and whatnot. This is the true red pill. This is a guy who 99.99999% of the world is completely unaware of, while everybody knows Hitler and Stalin and Mao. This is the worst guy who ever walked this earth. Okay? And he was not a Jew. He was an ethnic Russian. I don't have anything against Russians, but I'm just saying, every single time you guys come with all the NKVD Jewish crap, this was the worst mass murderer of the NKVD, and he was not Jewish. Let's move to another system, namely the Soviet Union's Gulag system. And here's again something that you will hear from revisionists. They're gonna say, oh, the entire Soviet gulags were run by Jews. What's their evidence? Well, they're gonna say, well, who was the commander of all of the Soviet Union's gulag system from 1932 to 1937? Go ahead and ask Wikipedia. It was a Jew called Matvai Berman. 
Or they're gonna say, guess who else ran gulags? It was a Jew called Naftali Frankel. <laughs> you can't convince me that a grand total of two Jews had control over Joseph Stalin's entire gulag system. That is ridiculous. It's a bit like saying, if Himmler had Chinese ancestry, then all German concentration and extermination camps were run by the Chinese. No, they weren't run by Himmler either. They were run by their individual camp commandants, and it is their ethnicity which counts if we are going to ask questions like that in the first place, as in, which ethnicity ran the gulags. Let's go back to Matvei Berman and get some context here. While the gulag system lasted for decades, he was in charge for five years. You can see on this list that Berman was one of many, and most of them were not Jewish. What about Naftali Frankel? He started his career, in fact, as a prisoner in the Solovki camp situated in the Solovetsky Islands in the White Sea, but quickly rose through the ranks to become commander of that camp. Later, he became chief of construction on the White Sea Baltic Canal project, and even later he was head of the Baikal Amur mainline railway camp. So, Naftali Frankl was one Jewish gulag camp commander. This is the kind of evidence revisionists have to make generic statements like Jews ran the gulags, citing Berman and Frankl, and then calling it a day. But when pressed for more names of Jews involved in the Soviet gulag system, the revisionists will continue to give sources. One book they frequently tell us to go and read is Nobel Prize-winning Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago book. But that is not the correct source if you want to find your so-called Jewish gulag commanders, the real source about Jews in charge of gulags is Dr. Hermann Greife's booklet called Zwangsarbeit in the Soviet Union, or Forced Labor in the Soviet Union. And I say booklet because it is only 50 pages thick. I cannot find much on the internet about this Dr. Hermann Greife, other than that he was a high school instructor and lived and worked in Nazi Germany and published this book in the 1930s. The book was published by the Nibelungen Verlag, which was part of the Gesamtverband Deutscher Antikommunistischer Vereinigungen, or Alliance of German Anti-Communist Unions, shortened Antikomintern, basically endorsed by the government of Hitler's Nazi Germany, which, as the whole world knows, hated Jews. Yeah, sorry. I'm not going to take seriously the writings of some random guy whose identity and biography is hard to ascertain, but who was working for Hitler's government and published a book in the 1930s about Jews running gulags. It's a bit like reading Mein Kampf to find out whether Jews are bad guys or maybe good guys. Get out of here. So at the end of the day, what can we conclude? The only real source for so-called Jews in the gulags is a book written by a guy living in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and fully endorsed by the government of Hitler. We do not find that in Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. We do not find it in any kind of proper publication after the war. And in fact, we only find two people, which is Naftali Frankl and Matvei Berman, as any kind of Jews in positions of power in the Gulag system, of which Naftali Frankl himself was not really someone in charge of a lot. He was just in charge of several camps, one after the other. So he was far less important than Matvei Berman, and Matvei Berman was only one of many other non-Jewish Gulag commanders. The NKVD, at its height, had less than 40% Jews, and that was just like for a handful of years. After that, the Jews were purged from the NKVD, and this is all before the Second World War began. Again, revisionists cite that single peak as some sort of industry standard that the entire NKVD was run by Jews. Bullshit. And regarding the other things, you know, Winston Churchill in his 1920s essay, he even made it clear that it wasn't Jews who were being communists, but rather that the Jews were divided up into Zionists and Bolsheviks who hated each other. And this is proven by Trotsky's attitude towards Zionism, this is proven by the Soviet Union's attitude towards Israel, 
and this is proven by the far more Jewish Mensheviks who fought the Bolsheviks and ended up losing, and that there are good Jews who are nationalist ones loyal to their own country. So many Jews fought, bled, and died in World War I, for example, for Imperial Germany and Austria, but also to the other nations. And that's another video that I have to make where I debunk the notion of the stab-in-the-back myth or legend, where revisionists claim that Germany was about to win World War I until it lost because the Jews betrayed it, which is, again, absolute bullshit, but that's another video. But returning to the conclusions of this video, I mean, everywhere where I tried to look at revisionist sources and investigate their claims, I found out that the Jews never ever held any kind of majority among the Bolsheviks. I mean, we looked at Lenin being a Jew, and it turns out he wasn't, so we debunked that, and then we looked at Vladimir Putin's 85% Bolshevik Jewish statement, which again turned out to be bullshit, so I think we've covered a lot in this video. And if you look at the Politburo, if you look at the People's Commissars, if you look at the First Central Committee, in all these areas, Jews never made up more than half, not even close to half. And the fact that whatever Jewish Bolsheviks there were, were only at the very beginning of the movement and then started getting hunted down by fellow communists is again proof that their presence was simply very brief and at, only at the very beginning before all the atrocities happened. And the Soviet Union is full of atrocities stretching over its 80-year existence. So, yes, this was a very long video, but at the same time I really wanted to look at all these different revisionist sources instead of, you know, just making blanket statements and calling it bullshit because that's not the way how you debate these people. You have to look at their sources. If you found this presentation interesting, but you want to know even more, then a book that I can really recommend for further reading is Paul Hannebrink's A Spectre Haunting Europe, The Myth of Judeo-Bolshevism. I think that book should answer any questions that are still left. And to understand the real-world implications of false statements like this, we have Putin's speech that has been televised, and a video of it has been uploaded on YouTube. And the video is called Putin... 80 to 85 percent Bolsheviks revolution were Jews. And you can see that this video has over 82,000 views and it was uploaded on September 8th, 2014, so about four years ago. And let's go check out the comment section because that's my favorite thing to do. The top two comments have over 400 likes each. The first comment saying, the biggest mass murderers were the Bolsheviks, but no films from Hollywood. I wonder why. And the second comment saying, You must understand, the leading Bolsheviks who took over Russia were not Russians. They hated Russians. They hated Christians, driven by ethnic hatred, and they tortured and slaughtered millions of Russians, and so on. So this is a quote that is a hoax quote, and it has been falsely attributed to Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a Nobel Prize winning novelist, historian, and critic of communist totalitarianism. And I've seen this quote so many times on the internet that um, I have already debunked this in a separate video, which you will find in this video's description. And I've done that to keep the length of this video a little shorter. But go and check that out. But this is a hoax quote that Alexander Solzhenitsyn never said. And you know how the old saying goes, a lie repeated a thousand times might become truth? Well, here you see it in action, folks. More and more people are believing that Alexander Solzhenitsyn named the Jew, even though he was a Nobel Prize winner. Let's take a look at the next comment. Zionist Jews did 9-11 and blamed it on the Arabs. 61 likes. And here's another comment that calls for a new pogrom. And it says, Putin should swiftly remove them from Mother Russia and send them packing to Israel. 69 likes. So you can see what kind of an impact false news and hoax quotes have in real life thanks to the age of the internet, where they just can be spread and then more and more stupid people believe in it and have their own pre-existing hatred like reconfirmed and aggravated. And this is the reason why I do my videos, okay? I may be a tiny insignificant channel with just a handful of subscribers and a handful of views but I consider it my civic duty to fight against this kind of fake news and false propaganda. Even if I'm just a single drop in an ocean, if I can do my part to help stop this tide of hatred, then I'm gonna continue making these videos. Thanks for watching. This debunking brought to you by Holocaust Documents. 
If you're interested in more stupid revisionist bullcrap that I have refuted over the past two years, make sure to visit my blog at inger.com slash small a slash 725 capital A 7. It's a relatively simple address you can find on my YouTube channel cover photo as well. See you around.